talking about? You know, because there's a lot of private sector. I'm from Alaska, and <coughs> the the uh, Bureau of Land Management and the uh, the state's divided into 13 native corporations, and uh, one of them, Zoyan, in the interior of Alaska where we live, is larger than the state of Texas. That's just one of 13, and they partnered with BLM and uh, Ken Ross uh, Mining to do a uh, visitor center in Fairbanks. So uh, that's also the Park Services Information Center, and so it's been quite successful as far as all of the above as far as private and, and public combining with their resources to uh, uh, showcase their particular interests. And so and I think when we have the panelists at the end, we're going to get into maybe some of the trade-offs and, and really the questions about uh, what does the private sector want to get out of it, and at what point do you say you can't get that from this, it's just not the right partnership. We deal with this in public TV all the time. Not the right partnership, right? Because we're after different things. So I'm going to move on to the third question so we don't get too deep into this discussion on this particular one. Uh, third question. In your opinion, to what degree is it possible to achieve situations in which cultural conservation and economic development are mutually beneficial? Let's look at the big number. It's entirely possible and worth pursuing, but more challenging in practice than is in theory. 13 people said that. Three people said entirely possible and often happens successfully. Um, but we said entirely impossible and extremely difficult, which I think makes sense. Then um, uh, not out of the question. So we, we kind of go to worth pursuing, but more challenging, and I have a feeling that some of the people who said more challenging have maybe had the experience with those challenges. Anybody want to explain any of those answers? I, I, I don't just need the 13. Right here. Right here. Uh, Jeff, you want to take this one? Um, the issue, I think, is that it's uh, it's. It goes to the same kind of scientific concept you have where you cannot measure a cup of water without altering its its temperature. So in this case, when we represent the past, we are in fact taking a position where we're not actually, you can't represent the past. You have to represent, you have to interpret the past. So you have an interpretation. Well, that interpretation will always be subject to change and uh, so the past isn't independent of the present. And, and for that reason, you, uh, you have the challenge of uh, how to balance the needs of the present with the needs of the past, and that, that can be really hard. Right behind you. Uh, my experience is in a residential historic district and a uh, historic building that we're working on now. As far as it being uh, a blend of things that you have to take into consideration tax credits, if this rates incentives that make this happen, that's what developers are looking for. Then when they see the reward, that's what makes it all go. It's all about money, and yeah, it's going to influence what happens, but without money, nothing happens. The thing sits, rots, decays, it's gone. I would just say that question three, to go directly back to question two, if you have the right people at the table, they're learning from each other and that can create understandings that lead to those compromises you need to make it work. If we have my panel, so we're going to follow up on that question. Talk about compromises. Another I'm being Kyle while you're the devil's advocate. Yes, I'm that's everyone. want. <coughs> no fun about conflict. It's me. Well, somebody said correctly that the public sector is generally corrupt. <laughs> of course, everyone knows the private sector is only in it for what they get out of it. As regards uh, whether you can interpret the past or 
represent the past when you start interpreting the past, then you aren't you playing with history? <clears throat> they all do it, you know. We they like to rewrite the book so these things didn't happen, you know. But there wasn't any war, or there wasn't any real uh, conflict or Never had slavery, all kinds of things. Yeah, I think, again, when we get to the panel discussion, I, I'll be moderating that, but I think we'll take some questions. I'm always interested in those very questions about can you compromise on the culture? Can you compromise on the history to make it, uh, you know, use the word more commercial, more popular? That's a very, very difficult question. Deal with. I think everybody who's involved in historical sites has probably been involved in reviving a story or an aspect of that history that didn't used to be told. And maybe now they do it. Now whether they're pushing another one aside, I, I never know. So these are all really good, good comments. And uh, what, I, what I want to be able to show here now, we have the, the full results that you've been doing, right? Online with these same questions. So let's just go back through and see how you guys measure up with the, the online uh, population here. So generally speaking, should cultural resources be used as a basis for economic development? 63% saying perhaps. That's the end of that question. Uh, perhaps, but only if it is done in a way that is both economically sensible and respectful of cultural resources and the people to whom they belong. 40% again, generally yes. So yes, people are thinking it can be done. Not necessarily easy. Let's take a look at the second question. And again, this is the online survey. Uh, if cultural resources are to be used as a basis for economic development, should most of the decisions <coughs> about how to do so be made in the public sector or in the private sector? Balance again, two thirds, a balanced combination, but I believe the rest is it's not as easy as it sounds, right? Is that the end of it? Uh, no, that's I think you were wrong. Okay. Balanced combination. And the third question, in your opinion, to what degree is it possible to achieve situations in which cultural conservation and economic Beneficial. 46%. Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, complex ethical and practical issues may arise. 35%. It's entirely possible. Uh, so again, entirely possible, but difficult. You can disagree whether I'm. You know. So I think that's interesting. There's a couple of things I wanted to, to share with you about the comments that, that came along with this. It, uh, response to that first question, uh, should cultural resources be used as a basis for economic development? One response would be yes, with good decision making in place, it can be such an incredible <coughs> opportunity for job creation in particular and have a lasting impact on economic development. Or attempting to use cultural resources for economic development fundamentally misunderstands both culture and economic it forms the quality of life, while the latter gets quantity. Question two, here's a couple of contrasting comments. In this fast-paced world, it is more important to preserve our cultural history and resources than ever. Quantifying the benefit in dollars and cents is difficult to measure, but well worth the effort. The other answer, I am wary of what happens to culture when it is modeled. And question three. Yeah, these are just drawn from the these resp online responses. Cultural resources are assets, and assets are necessarily for economic development. <clears throat> or insistence that art is a cultural asset objectifies and propertizes it as economic value increases, cultural values decrease. Uh, contrasting pair number four. Cultural resources can be a basis for economic development only if those resources 
are bought and distributed via voluntary, that is non-governmental means. Economic development can only arise through voluntary transactions, not by forcing people to support something by taking their money forcibly through taxes. And if the cultural assets are a public good, then I think a public agency should be the final arbiter of how the assets should be deployed. It is completely appropriate for there to be private sector participation on an advisory board or in some other decision-making role. However, I believe that public assets should ultimately be managed by public sector entities where there is more public accountability. That's kind of the different points of view, so we've chosen a couple of points of view where there's widespread agreement. All endeavors should be real and true collaborations driven by the needs and goals of the whole community. And the combination of entities must include the bearers and local stewards of the cultural resources from the get-go. Interesting. And it's, it's, it's interesting that these comments, these debates, and just going back to my own experiences in public television and partnerships, the very debates we have in our own context about partnerships, what we put on the air, who we deal with. I remember someone at a very large cultural institution talking to, at the time, American Airlines, asking them to support a big, big exhibit. And the airline executives said, how will this help me put butts in seats? I want to sell tickets on my airplane. And the answer was, we don't do that. We will not sell airline tickets for you. You are supporting what we do. We need to be a partnership, but that's not what it's about. Those are hard decisions to make, but I'm sure for all of you who would love to bring in support, corporate support, local business support, where you have to say, we're not really on the same page on that. So I think we're going to talk about that. Having thought about some of the underlying, I'm going to generally read this, so I'm going to go back to the podium. <clears throat> Having thought about some of the underlying philosophical differences among people concerned with the use of cultural resources to generate economic opportunity, and some differences, I hope, within the, in this group as well, let's consider some examples of situations in which those differences might play out. We're about to hear three pairs of contrasting speeches. These speeches will represent opposing views on controversies involving the combination of cultural conservation with economic development. Although these controversies are fictional, they may sound somewhat familiar because they are based on, on certain things that may have happened in recent years in this region. If you think you recognize some of the real life events, don't shout out, I know that person. Um, <laughs> these are imaginary scenarios, the details are uh, specific details are not necessarily factual, although they are based partly on fact. After each pair of speeches, we will be invited again to vote as to which speech is more consistent with your views. If you believe that the two speeches are more or less equally consistent with your views, you'll be able to indicate that as well. Again, we'll do the text polling. We'll vote by the text messaging using the same process. And again, we'll have a very brief discussion after each one. So here to perform the speeches, I'm really excited about this because I'm not, I'm not sure what to expect. Uh, two recent alumni of the acclaimed McKendry University Speech and Debate Team, Aaron Connor and Lance Allen. Aaron is a graduate of St. Louis University School of Law and an assistant public defender here in St. Clair County. Lance lives in St. Louis and works for an after-school program while preparing to attend graduate school. So, Aaron and Lance, it's all yours. Jacobs County, 
1827. Although he encouraged the Kalindi here to resist white settlement, he's now admired by whites and people of all ethnicities as a wise teacher and leader. We wanted the exhibit to reflect the Kalindi's wishes, so we consulted historians from the federally recognized Kalindi Nation in Colorado. They were pleased with the exhibit and attended its dedication. We had uninvited guests at the dedication too. Picketers. I told them I'd be happy to speak with them, but would need to do so afterward so as to not disrupt the program. I didn't recognize them, but they looked like white people, and it never occurred to me that they might be Native American. One of them, Joseph Eagle Eye, later told